Um, who was in Linda Rising's talk on estimation and deception? All right, so none overlapping audiences. That's fine too, because none of this is going to be already familiar uh, to you. I'm um, just uh, two words about who I am. Uh, I'm a freelance consultant. Uh, I'm interested. I used to be a programmer, so I know a little bit about tech stuff. Uh, nowadays, I'm into consulting, which means I'm also interested in the dark side, consulting and management and all that. Who's a programmer? Who's not a programmer? Interesting. So let's talk after. I want to know wh what you're interested in <laughs> in this topic. But uh, for everyone else, uh, I think we should be on the same wavelength of what design means. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So practices, that's the uh, essential uh, point of this talk. Now, you know, shape of the S, you know, it's a good transition into uh, another S-shaped thing, money, value. What, um, what am I hoping that you're going to get from this talk? Um, um, my intention is that you come away from this talk with a better sense of why in Agile uh, design is approached the way it is. Why, what is the relationship between things like pair programming and test-driven development? Is it coincidence that there are those two things in, say, extreme programming uh, and refactoring? Did they happen to be thrown into a pot and stirred? Or is there a deeper relationship? So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Uh, I would like you to come away from this session with renewed enthusiasm for doing some practices that you have been maybe doing, but not quite as much as uh, you should or you think you should. Uh, who's, who's doing test-driven development? OK. So, so there is some margin. Right. Uh, and uh, who's, who's writing unit tests? OK. Who didn't raise their hand before? <laughs> anyway, just a joke. Um, I hope that you can also, for those of you who are already doing test-driven development, so the others will be uh, uh, convinced to try it because they have a better understanding of how it works and why it might work. Uh, for those of you who are already doing that, I hope that you will find out about new things you can do to go to the next level. Uh, so things I will tell you about, which are not new, new, but new to you. But especially what I would really, ideally, if I had a magic wand that I could wave and, and have anything I wanted happen out of this session, is for you, all of you guys here, to create guys and girls. Uh, create new stuff. Things that nobody even know exist because no, no one has thought of them before. Because you're applying ideas from a different domain to the domain of source code design. That's, that would be pretty exciting. And then people will say, 10 years from now, this was invented in Bangalore just after the uh, session that happened at Agile India. That would be cool. So let's talk about code. Because I want to, uh, I know that most of you are programmers. I've done this with bigger audiences where people were also other in other roles. But I want to clarify the term design. So this talk is about design in, in one specific sense, which is the structure of source code, not other kinds of design. So one uh, article that I think will leave a lasting impression in this field is an article by Martin Flower from the year 2000, which was titled, provocatingly, Is Design Dead? Now, the context for, for asking this question was uh, back then, Agile, and you know the, the word Agile has not, had not even been formally 
uh, recognized as being the unifying theme of extreme programming and, and Scrum. That was the, the year after, 2001. Interestingly, though, uh, if, you, if you go to uh, IEEE, if you are members of IEEE, and if you search for the word Agile in, as, uh, in, in the domain of software engineering, and if you do a date filter so you can get only uh, the publications from before 2000, you will find one article uh, that has the, the term Agile in, in the title, uh, which talks about an Agile development methodology. So, so the term was actually invented by someone before the famous meeting in Snowbird. You've, you've heard about the Snowbird thing, right? When, when the Agile term was invented. Supposedly, because it turns out that someone else had come up with it before. So it was reinvented. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything is reinvention. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so back then, there was a perception that because uh, Scrum and Extreme Programming were kind of down on uh, heavy documentation and stuff like technical design documentation, like UML diagrams, uh, that meant that Scrum and Extreme Programming were anti-design. We don't do design. And so Fowler wrote this article to address this question. Are Scrum and Extreme Programming against doing design? And he came up, of course, with a resounding no. So there is design in Agile. So let's talk about design. What's the first thing that comes to mind? And I may already have primed you to think in those terms when I say the word design as programmers. I don't have candy anymore to motivate people. I had candy in the previous session. Uh, so relationships between subcomponents. Uh, what's a very common way of representing that? There you go. So one of the, you know, one of the first things that come into mind when we think about design, whether we like that or not, whether we approve or not, is, uh, I would even say, a specific kind of UML diagram, a class diagram, something that shows the relationships of inheritance between classes. That's one very narrow, very specific uh, view. But you know, for most people, it's, uh, if, if you want to give the impression, the appearance of design, you are going to create um, a class diagram. That's kind of a ubiquitous view of design. And before uh, Agile came along, I think that was a big part of what people saw as the whole of software design. And so one thing, thing that I think Agile has already accomplished is it has exploded, it has demolished some uh, dearly held notions about design that people used to have. Not everyone, but you know, kind of the uh, mythical universal representation of design, like uh, the caricature of design, if you want. So. Um, there had long been, and there still is, a uh, um, tendency to insist that design has to be visual. And in fact, if you look at some textbooks and some uh, um, formal uh, body of knowledge listings, you will see uh, you're only doing design if you do a visual representation. That's not true. Look at those two guys. Well, as far as visual, what they're doing is not, you know, it's not so hot. It's scribbles. But I think what's happening here, I don't know, because I was not there when, when this picture was taken. This is something I took from Flickr. But for me, it's kind of, you know, the new picture I want to have in mind when I think about design. It's people whiteboarding together. So they're having a conversation. That's a lot of what design is about to me now. Uh, I think of design 
And I'm going to reference Dave's uh, talk, which was conveniently just before. How many of you were in, in Dave West's talk just before? OK, so not much of a shared uh, background with the rest of you. But uh, he talked about design as the intentional and deliberate alterations of some of the elements or the relationships between the elements within a system. And, and one of the key words there is deliberate. Because, so for instance, if you, have, if you have a design question or issue, if you're trying to make a design decision, what does it take for you to be doing design? I know that's hard to answer. Uh, but let, let me try and narrow it down. If you have only one ID, then you're going to implement that ID. So are you doing design? Yes or no? OK, I'm going to argue that if you have only one ID and you implement that ID, you are not doing design. OK? So how many does it take? Two IDs? No. If you have two IDs, what you have is Sorry? No, what you have, if you have only two IDs. Do you guys know the story of the donkey between two piles of hay? And his, oh, this pile looks nice. But this also looks, looks nice. And his, uh, he starves to death between the two piles of hay because they're equally big. And he doesn't know how to decide. If you have only two IDs, what you have is a dilemma. And a dilemma is a bad place to be. So you are only doing design, in my view, if you have three alternatives. If you have three equally credible ways that you could do the design. And design is about articulating what the consequences of each idea is going to be and picking one with intention. So, and the visual thing is a secondary component. It doesn't have to be visual. You can make... You can do design in equations. You can do design in talk. Uh, some people are going to be verbal. Some others are going to be like I, I tend to be. You can see, you can tell because I move my hands a lot when I talk, especially about uh, conceptual stuff. So some people are naturally kinesthetic. So what's with the visual tyranny? Down with the visual tyranny. Anyway, I get, car get carried away. Um, Another thing that came from, uh, actually, that's pre-Agile, so from extreme programming, um, is refactoring. How many of you do refactoring? Great, everyone, nearly everyone. Um, but the thing about refactoring, and do you remember how it's defined in uh, Fowler's book? Refactoring is improving the design of existing code. So that's the uh, definition from this, the subtitle of the refactoring book. Improving the design of existing code. But what that means is the code has to exist first, and then we do design. And that goes counter to uh, the old conception of software development as a sequence of activities in which design preceded coding, which may have been a good idea at the time, but it led to this uh, uh, silly notion of design is something that a, a bunch of people do in a group, and then they throw it over the wall, as the expression goes, to the coders, and then the coders implement the design. Does that work? Have you seen it work? It used, but did it work before? OK, we can. We're not going to go into the historical debate, but I think, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the Agile community basically smashed that notion to bits. It's, uh, it's uh, dead and good riddance. <sighs> I've, this one, I think we still have work to do on this one, so it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, we were able to... Uh, go ahead.
no, no. Okay, so I, I agree. I mean, I, I can I can see where you're coming from. I I could put myself into your shoes and say yes, that's. Uh, um, bec but take take rather than say it that way, take the notion that you are only doing design if you have three alternatives, because I know some people who pretend that they have thought deeply about a topic and then they have come up with a solution but when you when you insist gently don't don't go making people mad at you uh, they only have one possible solution they, only, they have one way that the design could be they are they're not designers they are fanatics right uh, I'm, maybe I'm making some of you mad now but uh, Okay, let's let's talk more about that after. Uh, but the, the the key point is we we have at least one practice which gets us used to the notion that design is something that can and sh probably should, in at least in s some of the time, happen after the coding, and so we interleave design and coding rather than doing all of the design first and all of the coding next. That's one one thing that's already been, you know, kind of kind of settled, decided. Um, I'm more interested in, in thinking about what comes after. What are the or the rest of the things that we have to rethink uh, in order to have our design activities uh, really incorporate what we have learned from ten years now of agile. Uh, so, uh, so we have this. We have we are starting to have this notion that design is not something that one solitary thinker, you know, like so that's supposed to be my rendering of the Rodin uh, thinker, but you can tell I'm not a very good artist, uh, but as long as it gets the message across. Uh, it's not something you do in your chair. I'm doing design now. Mm. It's something that you do in conversation, in, in discussion and dialogue and debate with others. Uh, the problem is if you pick up a book on design, and, and you try to see conversations mentioned in there, uh, I don't think you will find much mention of that. So you pick up any, any book about software design. Uh, I have read a few, uh, older ones, newer ones, the book on design patterns, uh, some, some books from the uh, old times, uh, uh, there's a very good one which is called uh, Essential Systems Analysis, which although it, it has analysis in the title, is as much about design. But what, what was apparent in all of them uh, is kind of a, a single-minded focus on design as an individual activity. So I think that's something that's still in the future. Somebody is going to reinvent design practices that speak to design as a collective activity. And maybe that's going to come from the other uh, design disciplines who are probably closer to that than, than we in the software uh, development community are. And this, this one, I think, still has to, to, to be addressed at all. Uh, design is not about properties of the code or in, it's not about documents. Uh, so that's a very deep-seated one. Uh, you can see it. Uh, who, who's heard about cyclomatic complexity? Anyone using sonar? Oh, okay. Well, I feel bad for you <laughs> because I think uh, whatever version doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the problem with tools like sonar is that they focus on the code as if code was uh, something like metal or plastic or you know a, a substance with its measurable properties that you could predict if if you can measure you, you can measure the melting point of plastic you can measure the uh, flash point of an explosive substance 
And you can use that to make predictions, to say, if I put this in a, a, a liquid or in, in an environment which is at this temperature, then it's going to melt or explode or something like that. And well, what I think, what I see behind the ideas like sonar is kind of trying to have the same predictive ability. So if I have a piece of software that has this much cyclomatic complexity, uh, that's its flash point. It's going to explode into, into a, a shower of uh, sparkling bugs. Uh, so that's what I call the uh, code as a naturally occurring substance fallacy. But design is not about that. It's not about achieving that kind of predictive uh, power about how, how this stuff that's out there is going to behave. What it, sorry? Uh, let, let's let's save save that because I'm 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 going to I'm going to bring my side of the argument and then wh when you have that in mind, uh, I think we'll, we'll be in, in a in a good place. Um, but because I, I'm already anticipating at least part of what I think is a reasonable counter argument, which is well, if it's not about the code, you know, we spend all the time, uh, you know we spend a lot of time in there down in the source code. So if it's not about the code, what is it about? And I'm glad you asked the question. If you, you didn't, but I'm glad you asked the question uh, because I think it's about uh, it's about brains, right? What's what's the uh, salient fact about software development? It's that until they manage to automate it, and I think good luck with that. Uh, it's a, it's a human creative activity. So it's uh, performed by uh, a specific piece of hardware, which happens to be uh, legs and arms and a heart and a stomach, but possibly the most interesting part of that is near the top, you know, encased in in a protective shell of bone, and it's the brain. So I want to talk. We've talked about design. I want to talk about your brain, right? And <laughs> so most of you haven't seen Linda Rising's talk, but I'm going to. I'm going to be talking about things, and you will think, oh, they're, they apply to other people. So uh, I w I'm using the expression, your brain, uh, with deliberate intent. So th I'm going to be talking about things that happen in your brain, that I'm 99% sure apply to you, as well as to me. And hey, it's great. We have something in common. So what's the the salient thing about your brain. It's a system designed by evolution. Evolution is not smart. Evolution is patient. Very different things. So your brain is the result of, I hope I'm uh, offending anyone with this <laughs> observation, but that's uh, it's what I happen to believe. Uh, your brain is the result of millions of years of evolution. Uh, and evolution is patient, but it's stupid. So your brain uh, is riddled with bugs. Okay, and uh, it's maybe a pretentious thing to say, but I'm tempted to, to hypothesize a law, uh, the law of software quality. Uh, no, that's arrogant, but uh, just to, to try that on you. Bugs in the code always come from bugs in the brain. I know that's a strong statement. Uh, but I'm making strong statements so that they can be disproved, right? So, so we can argue about them. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not attached to those opinions. They are just my best guess at the moment. So everything we need to know about software bugs, we can learn. Maybe not everything, but a good deal of what we need to know about software bugs, we can learn by looking at the bugs in our own brain. So you're going, uh, what does he mean by a bug in the brain? Maybe some of you already know. But I'm going to talk about that. Uh, so for you've seen uh, Mary Popendick's talk, have you? No, that was the day before. OK, so maybe not as much of an overlap between the management agility and the technical. Agility, and that's you know that's a shame. It's inter interesting to 
straddle the fence to see both sides. But uh, she talked about something that's come out of recent research, which is that the brain has two systems, a fast system and a slow system. The fast is heuristic. It's fast and frugal. Uh, it, it goes fast, but it makes lots of mistakes. And it has a slow, more deliberative, more analytical system. So that's one way, one very broad way of looking at things. Uh, so I'm mostly going to be talking about mistakes that we make when we rely on the fast system. So one of them is um, what I call over-interpretation, the fact that we do not tolerate ambiguity. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that. Another interesting one is the mind projection fallacy. Um, we project. What I mean by that is if, if we think something, if we experience something in our brains, we tend to believe that it exists that it is in the world out there. And actually, that's false. So I'm just going to prove that to you now. I'm going to introduce you to my girlfriend. That's a joke. She's nice, though. She's fully clothed. OK, now I want to, I want to so uh, you're, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a few minutes, but don't do that right away because I want to, uh, everyone to do it at the same time. So instructions. Uh, if you see the dancer going around this way, pivoting on her left foot, please, when I say, not now, raise your left hand. If you see her pivoting the other way on her right foot, raise your right hand. Okay? Now. Look around you, keep your hands up, and you will notice something interesting, which is that... Sorry? I didn't get that. You're not all raising the same hand. That's the interesting observation. But you're all seeing the same thing. Mm. I showed this to my children. So I have three kids, boys, uh, and they all had the same reaction. And you know, they say that the truth comes out of the mouth of babes, of children. Uh, and uh, they were looking at the image, and they saw the dancer reverse directions. Who has seen this yet? Aha. Not everyone, but it, some of you will see it happen. It will kind of take you by surprise, and maybe you will have the same uh, uh, idea that my kids had, which was, Daddy, you changed the picture. Of course, that's the natural explanation. But no, I did not change the picture. So what's going on there? It's interesting. Your, what's going on there is your brain is lying to you. This image is really, I mean, objectively, insofar as anything can be known objectively, this image is ambiguous. It has no... Uh, uh, z-axis information. It has no depth information. So some of you maybe do image processing. Um, all the information is flat. So the image could be either the projection of a spinning dancer going clockwise or counterclockwise. It could be either of those. So normally, if your brain was in the business of telling, so some of you are going mad now, trying to make her change directions. Uh, the tip I can give you is you have to narrow down your vision to just the foot, and you have to make an effort of imagination to see it as a left or a right foot. And it works. And so when you get, you, when you master the skill of making her change direction and purpose, you will, you will have learned something totally useless, <laughs> but <laughs> You will at least have learned something. Um, so your brain is lying to you. It insists that you are going, to y that you are seeing her spin in one specific direction, and actually the reality is otherwise. So that's, I want to say, QED at this point, proof. Right? Anybody disagree with that? Anybody disagree with me that your brain is lying to you? Okay. Well, or you're, you know, so you could, you could retreat and say, 
uh, it's not really my brain, it's my perceptual system, but the rest of me is fine. Okay, uh, so let's continue talking about bugs, which are those bugs in the brain are collectively known as uh, cognitive biases. So I'm going to talk briefly about three of those respectively known as confirmation bias, anchoring, and the Dunning-Kruger effect. No, uh, it's not just those three. There are many, many more. So just you know, to start a list, groupthink, narrative fallacy, illusion of transparency, change bias, availability heuristic, learn helplessness, conformity bias, bystander effect. There are many, many, many of those. Um, and there are many very solid studies which prove those biases, those bugs exist. So, I mean, uh, cognitive scientists, they would make good testers of software because they know how to really reproduce a bug. Uh, they, they know how to isolate a bug. They know how to, to really, really narrow things down so, uh, so, so they have definite proof that it's this thing that's going on and not something else which looks like it. So these guys are good. We could learn from those guys. But do we? Do we learn from those guys? Have you, have you read any? So who, who's, who's got a formal education in software engineering? I don't, so I can't raise my hand. Well, I, I have a degree in software engineering, but I'm an autodidact. Uh, which is why I, I get away with studying things I'm not supposed to. So those of you who have formal education in software engineering, have you read a, a paper about cognitive biases as, a, as part of your studies? And that's a shame. Because we could really learn a lot from those guys, but the amount of ink devoted in all of software engineering as a discipline, it's not zero, uh, but the amount of ink devoted to those topics is, I think, about as big as that dot on the exclamation, exclamation point that we just moved away from. So very, very tiny. There are a few guys who have been saying for years and years that we should pay more attention to psychology and cognitive science, and pretty much nobody listens to them. So what can I do? I can only try and continue what I've started doing, which is to make you experience some of those cognitive biases. That's the next, that's the next topic. You're, you're ahead of me. So, so I'm going to try and, and be quick with those. Uh, so we're not going to try this experiment live. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what it is. So but any testers in the room? Okay, um, confirmation bias. Uh, I'm going to directly address the equivalent in software. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what this is. Uh, when you write a piece of code, and then you try to think about ways that it could be broken, you're going to think almost systematically about tests that verify that it does work. You're going to be thinking about positive test cases. A guy named Peter Wason uh, did and repeated many times this experiment where he shows uh, four cards, three, K, eight, A. So those, the original cards were actually, uh, I think, A, K, uh, four, and seven. So I don't know why he picked something that spells the name of a gun, but, uh, I wanted to avoid the gun reference. And he asked people to check, to, to validate or invalidate a rule. And the rule was, so, so those cards have one, a number on one side and a letter on the other side. And the question was, which cards do you need to turn over to check whether the rule that a card with an even number on the front has a consonant on the back, or vice versa. Yeah. 
Okay, so so there are there are different answers, and only one <laughs> correct answer. So some of you are wrong. Sorry to break this to you, and uh, so so he tested various hypotheses like are people misunderstanding the the question, and frankly I did not take special care in formulating the question. So so those of you who are wrong now. It could be not because of, of confirmation bias, but because I'm, I'm confused about asking the question the right way. But you know, what matters is you can look at the paper and you can look at everything he did to make sure that it was this one thing and not something else that was going on. So, but let's try and reason this through. So, do you need to turn over the three? No. Why? Because it's not an even number, so it doesn't matter what's in on the other side. The rule only talks about even numbers. So we do need to turn over the 8. Because if it has a vowel on the back, then the rule is disproven. Do we need to turn over the K? Yes? No? Yes? No? Make up your minds? <laughs> no, we don't. Because whatever is on the other side will only confirm the rule, so anyone who thinks that we do need to turn over the K, I strongly suspect that this is confirmation bias talking. We don't need to turn over the K. If it's an even number on the back, then it's a confirmation of the rule. Uh, if it's a, an odd number of the back, as per the reasoning earlier, we don't need to turn it over, right? Because it's not, it, it's not covered by the rule. Do we need to turn over the A? Yes, because if it's an even number on the other side, then the rule is disproved. Right? So you can see right there that it's a hard task. Interestingly, there is a way to make this task a lot easier, even though it would be structurally exactly the same. And um, can anyone guess? I'm, sh I'm sure you're going to be surprised by the answer. OK, so you're, you're all programmers, right? So you know, you, c you can tell me that. If I change the name of a variable, does the program behave in the same way? I, s I change all instances of variable foo to bar instead. And there are no other variables named bar in the system. So we we, there is not a problem of aliasing or conflict. I need to go faster. But this is so interesting, right? So we, we change a variable name, and there, there are no uh, traps. Does the program run the same? OK. And the mind doesn't work that way. So if I were to change uh, the, you know, if I were to change the system to say, uh, instead of even number, I'm going to say a human aged older than 21. Okay? And instead of odd number, it's uh, a human aged younger than uh, 21. Uh, instead of a consonant, I say uh, a human carrying an alcoholic drink. Okay? And instead of a vowel, it's a human carrying uh, a non-alcoholic drink. And the setting is a bar. So this presentation does include the joke. A man walks into a bar, and, uh, and he sees a waste and test. Uh, it's not a funny joke, but it's, it's still a bar joke. Um, now, if I ask you, who are you? So, so you, you see a young guy, and you see an old guy. Basically, uh, if you ask someone, are you a good driver? Are you a good programmer? Uh, people tend to systematically rate themselves as being better than an average driver, for instance. Uh, or so probably it applies to programmer, but I don't think it has been studied formally. Um, people systematically tend to rate their own ability the higher, even as they are lower in the actual performance. So that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, anchoring and priming, those are fascinating. The classic study on anchoring, on, on, 
priming, sorry. Uh, and there's an experiment, but I'm going to skip that and I can tell you about it later. Um, I want to show you something else instead, which is, uh, I think, uh, it's worth a laugh. Um, and some of you may have already seen it. If you have, please don't spoil it. Because for anyone who hasn't seen it, it's a very nice surprise. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So priming, uh, they did this experiment with a control group and a normal group. So it was a, a controlled experiment uh, of students. And they asked the students to uh, perform a word uh, test. So put a sentence together. Very simple test of linguistic ability. But actually, what they didn't tell the student was that the experiment was not the word test itself. It was what happened when the students walked away from the room where the experiment was held and back to the elevator, which was at the end of a long corridor. And what the, the experimenters did, sneaky people, uh, in one half of the word test that they gave to people to make a sentence together, uh, there were words like uh, uh, pension, Florida, that's the US, so that Florida is where people go when they retire, uh, dentures, you know, false teeth, uh, so stuff like that. So what does that make you think of? Old people. And the, the control group was getting words like apple, uh, uh, bicycle, stuff like that. So what do you think happened? Excellent. Good prediction. So, but at the time when they did this experiment, uh, that was extremely surprising because uh, priming effects had already been uh, proved and studied, but the, the dominant expectation was that if, if I'm talking with you and I'm slipping in some words in, in the conversation, it can maybe affect your verbal behavior. So you're going to talk to someone else and maybe you're going to use the same words in imitation, but not your behavior. People were sure that your actual motor behavior was not dependent on priming effects. And these guys proved that indeed motor behavior could be influenced by things you had no idea were influencing you. And so Linda Rising in her earlier talk uh, was uh, talking about estimation, which is a, an interesting problem for programmers. And she was showing how anchoring and priming effects could change the estimates that you give. So for instance, the weather outside may change the estimates you give in, a, in a, an estimating meeting. That's, that's something. We think we are giving only rational answers to rational questions, but actually we're in and all because of bugs in the brain. Let's uh, skip the experiment because I want uh, I, I'll save the surprise for the end. It's my kind of Christmas. You open the presents as late as possible. Uh, but I want to talk about practices. Design. Right, so uh, many people in the community say that planning poker is about conversation. So conversation ties back into design. It's about how long is it going to take if we take this decision versus how long is it going to take if we take this other decision, and that's design. But it's not the main reason I want to talk about planning poker. And then I'm, we're going to talk about future directions, and maybe that's also something we can talk about in, in the after uh, part of the session. So what I mean by that whenever you grab me in the, you know, in the hallway or at coffee or because you've been thinking about those things and you want to, want to test whether your understanding is correct or you want to, to run some ID past me and I, I will be available. For that. So the thing about the current design practices is you can pair them together usually with a cognitive first example I thought of, which was the first inspiration for saying, yes, I really need to give a talk about this and tie the thing together for other people so that 
we have more brains working on that particular uh, 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 way of seeing at things because clearly it's producing interesting results. When I came across TDD, I thought, oh, genius. And then you write the code, and then you refactor. That's important. But it's not what I'm... The focus is going to be on test first, code later. So who does that? It's not quite the same thing as I write code, and I also write unit tests. Because if you write the unit test after the code, you are not going to get the same good results as if you do test-driven development, as it was introduced by Ken Beck, which is I write the test first, and I write the code after. And why is that? The answer is on the side. Confirmation bias. Uh, I need to give you a quick bit of history. Uh, so who, who said they were a tester? I'm sure I saw one hand. So do you know uh, uh, a guy named Glenford Myers? The art of software testing. And so that has a, a list of things that he calls the actions of software testing. I'm not sure if you remember axiom number four. No. But raise your hand if you have heard this. A developer should never test their own code. Who, wait, wait, so who believed it? I did. And I can tell you, this is a little confession time. Uh, at one point I was uh, very loud when arguing with my management. No, I'm not going to test my own code. Everyone knows that's some, not something you do. It's uh, stupid. It's a bad uh, use of my time. We should have an external testing to, it, to it test my code. And obviously, that's one of the things that has changed with stream programming and Agile in general. We are much more into uh, developer. that word design uh, I shouldn't probably but it, it, testing the way a developer does it testing the way a developer approaches it go figure whenever someone says you know something like that which is a very sweeping claim uh, and they have a because. In general, what history remembers, what we remember, is just the why this inversion is so powerful. So that's the day I figured that out. I was, oh, yes, that's the reason. And maybe that's not the whole reason. And maybe I'm just making a, a, a mountain. Between the world of software and the world of cognitive science. And there are others. Uh, I think about pair programming as something that is a huge antidote to the Dunning-Kruger effect. Because what happens when you have a young, novice, inexperienced programmer, and you ask them to write some code on their own? They think they're a hotshot. They think they're the best programmer in the world. That's the Dunning-Kruger effect at work. And so if you ask them to do a code review, what? No, I don't need a code review. My code is perfect. Right? Who's seen that? Or something like that. OK, some of you are lucky. Uh, you have young developers who know proper humility, maybe. I don't know. But uh, 
nevertheless, I, I, I think that's, a, and maybe the rest of you are already doing pair programming. Uh, so what you do is you pair a more novice programmer with a more experienced one. So the more experienced one you know, kind of checks that enthusiasm. And at the same time, he's, he's transferring knowledge. But another thing interesting happens is even the more experienced programmer is actively learning something from the younger because he has to bring his ideas down to concrete, to the concrete level where the, the younger one can actually understand. So teaching, some, teaching something is a great way to understand it better, which is also why programming is done by smart people because you're teaching the dumbest thing there is, which is a computer. So you have, whenever you have to transfer some knowledge from your head to the computer, you have to be very precise about what you think. So that's why programming is a great way to debug your thinking. We should, we should do more of that. We should do more debugging of our thinking, which means we should be able to you know, kind of reverse engineer the bugs, reproduce them, know about them, install patches for the bugs that we cannot fix. Ah, planning poker. Um, planning poker is an interesting case. I, I wanted to, I wanted to at least to have one example where the the agile practice. Because yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to be to spend one hour saying agile is great because it cures all confirmation bias. Uh, who's going to believe me? Uh, some agi agile practices are actually quite stupid when you think of them in the context of cognitive biases. And that's also, I think, why we should learn more cognitive science. It's because there are some things we've been doing which are stupid, and we should stop doing them. So, and I think planning poker is one of them, so maybe some of you are mad with me now, but, uh, but that's okay. Uh, planning poker is uh, problematic in the sense that it plays right into anchoring effects. So anchoring is a slightly different thing from prime, priming, but it's the same deal. If I want to get a raise from my boss, uh, so that's a tip maybe some of you will find useful, even though it's nothing to do with design, but I will gladly share it. Uh, you go to your boss and you, ha you ask for a very high raise. Right? You, you say, I don't know how much is a typical raise here, but uh, uh, you, you ask for a 30% raise. And that's your opening bid. And of course, you're going to, you know, you're going to, nah, yeah, times are tight. Uh, uh, I can't do that. Uh, okay, how about a 20% raise then? And maybe, maybe you will get a pleasant surprise because the boss tells you, okay, if that's what I have to do to keep you here, uh, I'm going to give you a 20% raise. So what, you, what you have done is you have anchored the negotiation. It's a bad thing. Don't, don't actually do it unless you have to. Uh, you have anchored the negotiation at a starting number, which is higher than it would otherwise have been. And maybe, maybe your boss knows about it. So the, the, the second you step into his office, he says, no, you're going to ask me for a 5% raise, but forget it. We don't have that kind of money. You have been anchored, right? So it works both ways. Um, and what happens in planning poker is that someone gives a number, right? I think this story is a 13. What happens? Cognitive bias kicks in. Everybody anchors on the 13. And what's worse, the rules for planning poker make this even worse because they say, if there are people in the room who disagree with the 13, we do a second round until everyone converge. What happens? The people who are the most convincing even if they are wrong, they are the ones that everyone converges on. Okay, so instead of having a correct estimate, you are encouraging people to play for the leader, basically. Which I okay, that's one of the things we can talk about. Uh, I have very little time to cover future directions, but uh, I actually prefer to do that, you know, in the informal. Uh, conversations. But something that I think is a good idea, you all do retrospectives, try this. Do a, a design-themed retrospective. Do it the exact same way you would do a normal retrospective, which is uh, uh, don't do that with a uh, you know, code in front of you. Don't do that over email. Get people in a group, in a room, and, and get them to say, 
what do you think is doing is working well with our design what could be improved what have we learned about design in the past iteration try that I think it's a, it's a potent combi by combination because uh, it, it combats uh, the Kruger effect for one because you have a variety of perspectives it brings cognitive diversity which has been uh, you, could, you can always write to me and email me and I will send you pointers to research. Uh, diversity is generally a positive thing. So it, it's a, a, an antidote for groupthink. Uh, one thing that I think works great is the coding dojo. I've seen people who participate in the coding dojo become better programmers over time in an impressive way. Uh, pair programming, I think the active ingredient of pair programming, and we use that in the coding dojo, what I call programming out loud. So that's where instead of being in the zone with your headphones on and you're just typing away, hamming at, hammering at the keyboard, you try to explain to someone else what is going through your mind as you program. So that's what happens in pair programming, but you can, re you can reproduce that in other settings. And so I think coding Dojo as a, as a, as a way to practice programming and design moves is a, a great thing. So you put a group of people, 10 people in a room, and you have only one pair programming, uh, projecting the screen on, on, a, on a projector, uh, and everyone is allowed to interrupt as soon as they don't understand what's going on. That's basically the rule. There are a little more details, but I, I just want to throw that as a teaser. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing that has already been invented. But really what I'm, um, I can't wait to see is what you will invent with this new weapon in your arsenal, which is let's go see what the cognitive science people are saying about how the brain works. And let's figure out how we can apply that to software design problems. So to close, what I want to, uh, the way I want to summarize this whole talk and tie everything together is by saying to me, this is the new understanding of design. Design is about practices that help your brain deal with code more effectively. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you all. Is the team in It's a bit dark. OK, so it's easy to miss something that's dark on a dark background. Uh, well, maybe that spoils the effect of it. Who knew about this one already? Some of you. Uh, but anyway, at some point, he was walking in front of someone wearing white. Did you notice anything? All right, so maybe, maybe there's a, uh, you know, with what with the contrast, there's something of a uh, confounding effect, as they call it. But um, this is such a fun video. I always show it. So another, another kind of cognitive bias, uh, attention bias. I don't want to keep you uh, from the coffee break. Uh, thanks again. And uh, feel free to come talk to me anytime now or later uh, to, grab, uh, to grab one of my cards uh, or to ask me for one of my cards. Uh, and uh, see you tomorrow when I'm doing another talk, if you're interested. Thanks. <laughs>